My dear friends, please welcome warmly Bishop Stephen Charleston. I'm delighted to be here. I will say a few words um, to help put what I'm going to say into context because I don't know how many of you know beyond what uh, she described as back background uh, about my work in Native American tradition and Christian thought as well as in a global uh, relationship and talking to people of many traditions. So I thought the best thing I could do when I came here would be to start like a, a teacher should, to sort of put this into a context so you could see where I'm coming from. Uh, then I'll tell you my whole point. This is really interesting. I'm going to tell you my whole point in about two minutes. And then you're free to leave. You can. <laughs> but it, really, I want to tell you my whole point in about two minutes, and then I want to illustrate it from native thought and native tradition uh, with some stories, with some um, thoughts that I hope you'll find intriguing. And then when I end, when I finish, I want to end with um, so what have we learned from this? A kind of a moment of, of drawing the strings together in order to, to, to set before us something I would call an agenda, a four directions agenda of what all of us, whatever our faith tradition may be, whatever our background may be, something we can take home with us, something that we can engage and say, yes, this is where I could stand too. I believe that and I want to see it happen. So having given you this sort of a, a synopsis, let me jump into this because I, I wanted to be sure not to go uh, over time. I get excited when I talk and I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss the chance for us to have some conversation. So I'm gonna be careful and not, uh, not let my natural proclivity to be passionate. Uh, run away with me. So let me just start with a context so you'll know a little more about me. I don't know where you come from in terms of your tradition or your religious background. I know that the Gibbard Center brings together people of many backgrounds. So my talk is designed to be generic in that sense. It is to reach out and present things to everyone. If I am speaking in terms of uh, my understanding as a native person of the Creator, of what we call the one God, the personal God, and this is not in your tradition, uh, please, uh, uh, thank you for graciousness, and just please see, try to hear what we're saying from our viewpoint. It may be somewhat different from those of you who don't think that there is a personal creator or a consciousness. Or you may use that sense of consciousness to say that when I use the word God or I use the word the Creator, the Great Spirit, I'm speaking in a way of a collective consciousness, an awareness, a being, a presence, however you want to define it in your context, that is active and that we can engage with, have a relationship with. Other thing I want to say to put this whole talk into some perspective is it is odd to me, but quite in some ways very understandable, when people ask me, but if you're a Native American, why are you a Christian? How can you be a Christian? You'd be amazed how many times I've been asked that. And I've been a professor teaching Native American religious thought for, I, can, I don't know, I've lost count. Uh, I've taught in three major seminaries, been the president of one of them, been on the faculty in uh, a Lutheran school, an Episcopal school, and a Methodist school, all teaching what, a lot of what I'll be talking to you tonight about. And very often students would say, but how can you be Christian? So you'll find out a little more when I get into what I wanted to talk to you about. But just in general, I want to, I want to give you some history. I became uh, a, a, a spiritual person in terms of my vocation when I was four years old. When I was four years old, I lived in rural Oklahoma and I lived in an extended native family. We're Chata people, but my mother's Cherokee. So I'm both Chata and Cherokee, but, but I'm enrolled as a citizen of the Chata nation. That enrolled business means I can trace my family back to when they first came to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. 
I know the names of the man and the woman who were, who, uh, were my ancestors that took that long death walk from our homeland to Oklahoma. I'll say some more about that later. So I have a very deep and intense native tradition of which I grew up as a child. And I grew up in a family that spoke language, understood the culture, talked about it, and for whom it was central to our lives. That we would no more forget, listen, we would no more forget the story of our coming to Oklahoma, uh, the story of our ancestors, than many of you listening to me now could forget some formative moment in your life some defining characteristic of your community or your culture. So I grew up really unselfconscious of myself as a native person, as a Chata person. But I also grew up with a, just an acceptance of the fact that I was, in that sense, bi-religious or bicultural because the Chata people were Christians. You'll hear part of the story of when we took the Trail of Tears that we were Christian people and that it was a part of our life, which I'll talk about in a minute, that was not seen as the white man's religion or a separation from our own tradition, but in fact, quite a fulfillment, quite an extension of it. It fit like a hand in a glove. We were not surprised by what the missionaries told us. In fact, we could tell them much of the same story and perhaps sometimes even a little better. So my being native and Christian is not uh, an oxymoron. And it is the assumption that it is that will help us weld together tonight a deeper and richer understanding of what true interreligious dialogue and experience means. So I wanted to say in terms of my context, I have been both a traditionalist, native person, and a Christian all of my life. I have been blessed by the nature of my work to visit almost every native community in the United States and Canada at some time. I have sat with elders and talked into the wee hours of the morning in Alaska and in, uh, in Rupert's Land and in the Deep South and on the Navajo reservations and everywhere I can imagine I have learned. I've said to people, I did my graduate, white graduate study in graduate schools. I did my Native American graduate study out in the community with grassroots elders, medicine men, medicine women, and teachers. I did my graduate study in the sweat lodge. I did it at the Sundance. I did it in community life with spiritual people in the Kiva who taught me what it means to have a Native tradition and be a Native person. So I am a hybrid, you see. I am speaking to you in a way that may seem different to some of you who have a certain image or a certain understanding of what a native person in, in uh, spiritual life should be like. Uh, I represent a history and a story that is rich and profound and I believe in lightning. And let me show you here now what I mean. I told you I was going to kind of tell you everything I was going to say in about two minutes, and so uh, with my little biography there, uh, here's, here's what I came to tell you. Um, I wanted to talk about honoring the earth in the context of what the wonderful work that happens at this center is about, to present it to you in a way as a native person, as a native spiritual teacher, as, as, a, as a person of faith, from my strange and wonderful mixture of who I am, to bring it to you uh, in, in a way that I could somehow say very simply and not exhaust you with all the cultural detail that could embellish this conversation forever. Because Native people, as you know, come, we are a vast collection of different traditions, different languages, different nations, all across the United States. And to try and summarize all of that is difficult. But I think I found one way to do it, and to give a single word to represent what I want to say, and then four sacred directions around that word. And if you'll hold this in mind and then let me illustrate it, I think you'll benefit or find something interesting in what I'll say. Okay, the single word is kinship. That's what struck me as being the best way 
I could present to you a Native American understanding of honoring the earth, listen, of honoring Mother Earth, and also communicate across religious lines, communicate across cultural lines, and present to us an image and an expression of what our common call must be in this century a revolutionary, dynamic call to what we need to do as men and women together, no matter what our religion or background may be. Kinship is the word I chose, because kinship, if for us as Native people, embodies a powerful witness. In the Lakota language, I would greet you when I stand up to speak to you of spiritual things by saying, Mitakwe Awasa, all my relatives, you are all my relations. We are in kinship with one another. Kinship is one of the most profoundly important understandings in Christianity as well as Native American thought. For it was in the scripture, in the gospel, those of us who are Jesus followers, who remember this bizarre moment in the New Testament, this strange, crazy moment, where Jesus was up speaking to a group of people like I'm speaking to you. Listen, think about this. I'm speaking to you, and imagine if it were Jesus, and at that moment, wind came over, and you could hear her because Jesus was wearing a mic, and, and Gwen said to Jesus, Jesus, I'm sorry to interrupt your talk, but your mother is standing outside, and she wants to see you. Do you know the story, Christians, those of you who are Christians here? You know that story. Now, what would common sense dictate to you that the man would do? He would say to you, please, I'm so sorry, but my mother suddenly appeared and I've got to go see. This could be serious, so I'll be right back. Isn't that what you do? But what does he do? He looks out at all of us, all of you, and says, who is my mother? Now, if that's not one of the most bizarre spiritual questions in the history of religion from a major religious figure, I don't know what is. I love that question. That's cuckoo. That's crazy. What the heck does that mean? Who is my mother? I just let it hang in front of me sometimes. Because as a native spiritual person, it starts to resonate deep within me. Because looking out at all of the people, he said, you are my mother. You are my brother, my sister. You are related to me. Mitakwe Awasa. He says that. He says that. He says that in a sense that means that there is a kinship, a bond between us. And that somehow, in the core of that sense of kinship, listen, in the core of that sense of kinship, which we have lost, which is being stripped away from us as humanity, which is being replaced by shallow principles, kinship, what we used to feel for one another, what we were capable of doing together, how we identified one another, the most primal, fundamental, family-oriented understanding of who we are is kinship. When we first open our eyes as infants to the day we close them in death as elders, kinship marks us for better Kinship is, is so important to us as Native people. And so I bring it to you and say kinship is the centerpiece of what I want to say. And around it are four sacred directions. Our kinship to God, our kinship to the earth, our kinship to our relations, our uh, fellow creatures, and our kinship to one another. Hold that wheel in your mind. Kinship is at the hub. God, earth, all of our relatives and one another. And let's, let me illustrate why these are important. Here's the first one. Kinship to God. It was in 1972, I think, but I'm bad at numbers. I think it was in 1972. I was in a seminary training to become a priest, an Episcopal priest. And I was in my class in those days, what they would call an Old Testament class, which is what we call the Hebrew Bible. It's the Hebrew Covenant. It was, um, it was a class that Christian clergy take where they're learning, literally, about all the books of the Hebrew Bible. 
because it is the foundation for the Christian theology. And so I'm taking this class, and I'm like all first-year seminary students. I'm eager to learn, and I'm absorbing all of this. And the professor is well-known uh, uh, Hebrew Bible scholar. And he's laying all this information out. And I have been a Bible reader since I was a child. When I was four years old, when I said I had started my spiritual life, my family had no money uh, to speak of, really. We weren't rich or anything. So uh, I remember my great-grandfather was tasked with the job, because he was still living, of taking care of me when I was a toddler, because everybody else was off the farm working somewhere. And so it was me and my great-grandfather. And he would tell me Bible stories. And one evening, sitting on a hot Oklahoma night, out on the porch to stay cool, looking at the sky, at the stars, he said, do you know why I'm telling you these Bible stories? And I said, no, great granddad, I don't. But I remember what he said to me, because he said it's because someday you're going to grow up and be a preacher, and you're going to have to know the Bible. So I'm teaching you now, so when you grow up, you're, you're going to be preaching this, so you better learn it. And so I said, okay. And from that moment on, I thought and believed that I had been anointed, I'm a preacher, I've got to learn the Bible. So I would read the Bible. But I'm sitting in this Western graduate program learning about the books of the Old Testament, as they called it then, the Hebrew Bible. And I kept having deja vu. It was a weird feeling because I'm a native student out of Oklahoma, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the shadow of Harvard, listening to the rustle of the ivy on the walls. It was like this really big deal. And I'm sitting there and I keep thinking, uh, I've heard this before. I know this story and don't know it as a Christian. I know it as a native person. Now listen, I don't know what your religious tradition is, but those of you who are monotheists like me, let me ask you if your concept of monotheism is that God is the God of all times, all places, and all peoples. Yes or no? Yes. We as Christians, and I, I can't speak for others, but we as Christians believe that the God that we worship is not the God of a particular mountain or river. It is not the God of only one people. It is the God of everything. The God who made it all, correct. So the question then that we would ask ourselves is, what was God doing in North America during centuries of my people's life here? Interesting question. Was God the absentee landlord of North America? <laughs> kind of created North America, but wasn't that interested. Kind of a timeshare deal, let other people. My real interest is here in the Middle East. No? So was God uh, hiding from my people? No, we don't understand God is hiding from humanity. God reveals God's self. God takes the initiative. Am I speaking a language Christians would adopt? Yes. God takes the initiative. God reveals. Well, was God revealing stuff to our, my ancestors that God knew was baloney and was just kidding around with us? Was God telling us lies? Does God lie to my people? No, God was revealing God's truth. God was present. Did my ancestors get it all right? No. Were they completely wrong? No. So God was present and active in North America for centuries of my ancestors' religious development. And my people were responding to God in attempting to understand God and to, and to have in what? Kinship with God. A relationship with God. And while it wasn't perfect, they did understand it in many ways that were profound. Now listen and think about this. What is a testament? What is that anyway? If you pick up the Hebrew Bible and you start at Genesis and read all the way through to, with Isaiah and Jeremiah and the one of the prophets and the Psalms, and you ask yourself, what is all of this? It is a collection of a people's kinship with God. It is a collection of their memory, their collective memory of that relationship with God, and it is expressed in a variety of ways. Am I telling you something truthful? Yes, it is a collection of 
what, prophecies? Yes, proverbs, yes, chants and songs, yes, poetry, yes, histories of famous men and women, yes, histories of the nations of the tribes and what happened to them, yes. What is Native American tradition? What is Native American tradition? It is a collection of what? Of chants and of prophecies, of memories of famous people, of histories of creation myths, yes. 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 It is our memory. It is our testament. Now, the reason I was having deja vu is that among the, my ancestors is a story of how the nation, the people, first migrated to the promised land. Two twin brothers led the ancient Chata people on a migration from far in the west toward the east. And as the people migrated, the brothers carried a sacred staff before them. And every night they would plant the staff into the earth and the people would encamp around that. And every morning the staff would be leaning toward the east, indicating that the migration was continued. We must continue until we find the promised land, Chatiakne, the Chata homeland. And God promised our people that we would come to that land. And so we did. We came to what is today the state of Mississippi. In those days, it was to be our homeland. And there is a sacred mound there, Naniwaya, a high holy hill. Sound familiar? There is a, if any of this is sounding familiar to you, I hope you will think about what I'm saying. And we came to the high holy hill, the mountain, for us, and the staff was planted into the top of it, and the next morning, the staff had sunk into the earth and flowered. And we there made covenant with God and adopted our name, which is the name of all the nations of North America. If you ask them to translate their name from their language, we are the people. We are the chosen people. What? <laughs> wham, wham, wham. Danger, danger. <laughs> what did you say? Yes. We are the tribe of the human beings. We are people. We are the people. The people led by God to this place. The people given a promise of covenant. A people given a land. A people who became a nation because they made covenant with God for a sacred land. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Yes, ancient Israel had the vision of that connection between land and covenant and God and nationhood. And it formed ancient Israel and continues to inspire generations of people in Judaism to this very day, and rightfully so, for it is a powerful witness to what? The kinship with God, and the power and the effect that kinship has in the life of a disparate group of people who had no identity, who had no claim to where they might live or who they might be. Do you see how it roots you into the earth? When I'm talking about honoring the earth, when I'm trying to talk about native, uh, spirituality and the honoring of the earth and the rootedness of ancient Israel and the importance of the Hebrew covenant. Yes, all of that, yes. This isn't a competition. This isn't that this God, who is not the absentee landlord of anything, loved one group of people more than another. It is the way people tried to understand and relate to God and express their kinship. Is there an Old Testament, an original covenant, whatever language you want to use, a foundational relationship, a memory, a collective memory of the people of Africa with God? What would you say? What would you say? Yes. Do they have prophecies and proverbs and memories and songs and chants and histories of famous people? What do you think? Is there one in Asia? Yes. Is there one in the Pacific Islands? Yes. Was there one in Europe? How many times people ask me, how can you be Christian and Indian? And the other thing they'll ask me is, oh, you're so lucky to be an Indian because I'm a white person and I have no culture. <laughs> Some of you. Some of you may have said that, or thought it. Why do white people in the Episcopal Church, just use my own church, 
feel so attracted to Celtic Christianity. It's your Old Testament. It's coming through. It's still there. Paved over, yes. <laughs> Bulldozed by centuries of that kind of grasping, um, uh, kill the old memory kind of, of colonialism that we all suffer. And it was that original understanding of a kinship with something holy, something sacred, gods or God, something in the earth, something in the water, something in the air, something that moved the people to become clans and nations and a people and have dignity and pride in who they were. Did they get it all right? No. Did they, did they get it all wrong? No, they didn't. None of us did. That's the whole point of our collective kinship with God. And we've reduced that to this ridiculous competition about whose story's right and who wins and who loses. Where did that come from? It listened, and mark me well, it came from the same source that colonized the European people first before they used them as cannon fodder to colonize the rest of us and took farmers and, and, and women off the land and moved them into cities and colonized them and under an authority that used them as the mercenaries to go out and impose their same philosophy and their same will on the rest of the world. The kinship with God is essential and central. Okay, now let me go to the next one. Uh, kinship with the earth. In 1680, in 1680, a bizarre thing happened in the Southwest. In that time, the Hopi people, H-O-P-I, Hopi people of Arizona, uh, who are renowned among those of us of Native America uh, for their identity. Let me explain it to you this way. White folks uh, are very different. Those of you who are Swedish by background understand that while you're Caucasians, you're quite different from Greeks. But you're both still white folks, right? Spaniards, different from Germans. Orthodox Christians, different from Presbyterians. Differences. Same thing true with my people. Hopis, not like Lakotas. Lakotas, not like Choctaws, we're different. We have different cultures, different languages, different ways of doing things. If you want to understand who the Hopis were for us, I want you to think of a couple of choices, I would say. The Hopis in Native America would be like the Amish or the Quakers. Now try and imagine the Amish running amok and start killing people. Does that work for you? I mean, does that compute? Doesn't that kind of short circuit? What? Wait, whoa, if you saw that headline, Amish run amok, slaughter whole towns, film at 11. You think, I gotta stop smoking this stuff. <laughs> right? In 1680, the Hopis rose up and killed every Spanish person they could find. Slaughtered them. Massacred them. They went to the local Roman Catholic mission and tore it down stone by stone and carried the stones out into the desert and threw them away. What happened? What would drive a people who are known and among us as native people as the Hopi, the peaceful ones? A people dedicated to peace. A people who never had a war. A people who have no warrior tradition. They're not like plains people or, you know, the famous warriors and stuff. No, there wasn't any. They were corn farmers. They lived on mesas and went down to the valleys and raised corn. I used to laugh at my Choctaw heritage, saying the reason most have never heard of Choctaws is if they made a movie about my people, it would have been called Dances with Pumpkins. <laughs> Wouldn't draw a big crowd, you know? Well, the Hopis are dances with corn. They are a simple, peaceful, quiet, totally uh, pacifistic culture. But they went insane in 1680. What happened? What happened was uh, Coronado. The Spanish conquistadors looking for the cities of gold. Need that gold, gotta find gold. And uh, in 1549, they, uh, they sent 
They came up to the southwest. They're searching for the gold. And actually, they encountered the Hopis at Awatove, at one of the Hopi settlements, and pretty much ignored them. Because when they looked around at where the Hopis lived, there was nothing there, no gold, no nothing to rob, steal. And so they went off looking in other places. But they sort of left the Hopis in the backwater for a very long time. But then they returned. Then they returned. And it was in 1629, 1540 was when Coronado came. 1629, the Spanish friars arrived and they began with the mission of converting the Hopi. And they did so brutally. At first, oh, please convert. We weren't getting any takers. And then it got ugly. And yes, all of your thoughts about why Indians shouldn't be Christians because of the evil missionaries. Yes, there were some evil missionaries. Yes, there were. This is one of those cases. There are some other stories you might like to hear that were quite the reverse of very noble missionaries who died trying to defend Indians. But this was a case that was bad. And so they began to destroy the Hopis. Now, the Hopi religious system is important for you to understand. I hope you'll find this interesting if you don't know it, but I'll be very brief. The Hopis are a highly ceremonial people. They're like the orthodoxy in that sense if you're a Christian. They, they have a high ceremonial. It occurs in kivas. Do you know what a kiva is? It's an underground circular worship space that you reach by going down a ladder. You go down into the ground and you worship there. And part of the worship are dances on the pueblos, on their, on their plazas, but then they go down into the kiva for special services. And, and they have another part of their ceremony life called kachinas. Are you familiar with kachinas? They're often seen as little dolls, wooden dolls, about this big or that big. There are many different kinds of kachinas. Kachinas represent God's presence in the world as butterflies, as rain, as wind, as corn pollen. There are kachinas for all kinds of things. Those are sacred objects, and what the friars did was start burning them. They took them out of the kivas and smashed them. They refused to allow any of the dances to occur. And the Hopis put up with this. Mark how long it took them. From 1629, they continued that brutality and they continued to hold their services in secret until 1680. And during all of those years of oppression and horror, and think about that. Think about living under a force that would come in here and smash everything here. It's like Cromwell, it's insanity, it's vicious. It's the kind of oppression that is done with the heel of a boot. All of that the Hopis endured for years until finally they couldn't take it anymore. They went insane and that's why they rose up in what's called the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 and they attacked the Spaniards and killed as many as they could find and that's why they tore that church down. Because the church represented this form of oppression. Now what's the point of this story? It's tragic, it's sad, it sounds terrible. What's the point of it? When I was a very young man back in Boston, I was involved in some communications work, and they asked me, in those days, I don't think they could do it anymore, but they used to have the sunrise sermons. They came on at six o'clock in the morning, which nobody watched, but it was wonderful. I got asked, would you like to record the sunrise sermons in Boston for this week? Ooh, yeah, that'd be cool. I was in my 20s, what did I know? Sure. But we want you to do it like an Indian. Oh, sure, I can do that. I'll, I'll give you some sunrise sermons as an Indian. And so I did. I don't remember any of them except the one about the Hopis. Because I defined the Hopi Kiva as the command center for Spaceship Earth. And a lot of the Boston people go, ooh, that's cool. Yeah, Spaceship Earth. That's what it is, though. The Kiva is there because the ceremonies that the Hopis perform within the kiva is what keeps the earth spinning. And if they don't do it, the earth would stop spinning. And if that sounds odd to you, then think about this. The people who were Spanish had no concept of the higher science that we've discovered today, but the Hopis did. Because the Hopis said there were twin brothers who stood at the different poles of the earth with these poles and they would strike the top of the earth and the bottom of the earth with their poles and it caused a force to go around the globe of the earth, which was a ball, and made it spin. 
and part of the Hopi religion is that they were tasked by God, called to be peaceful, because they are the technicians who go down into the center of Spaceship Earth and every season and every year without fail, they do the technical work of their spirituality that allows all of us to have crops and rain and wind and air and happiness and abundance and the Earth continues. And if you force the Hopis to stop doing that, then everyone suffers, and the earth as we know it collapses. That's why they fought the Spanish and wouldn't convert. And it wasn't just the Spanish, because by 1849, when the Americans showed up, we were no better. We, we built a school uh, on Hopi land and demanded Hopi children go there and convert to Christianity. We cut their hair and denied them the right to speak Hopi, and the Hopis fought back under that oppression to the point that in 1890, 20 Hopi parents, 20 families, mothers and fathers, that would not convert and tried to keep their children from this deadly school where they would be de hopied were sent to Alcatraz Island and spent a year in prison. That, look it up. And that was because the Hopis would not back down. Peaceful though they were, they were dedicated to what? They were dedicated to the kinship with the earth. They were dedicated to an understanding that they were responsible for this world. You hear what I'm saying? They were so dedicated and so profoundly called to that as a spiritual form of life that no matter what the oppression was, however horrifying it became, whether they were imprisoned or killed or beaten or starved or humiliated, the Hopis would stand up for what they believed quietly and peacefully and take the blows. Long before there was a Gandhi to teach us that against power you stand and take the blows, there were the Hopi. And they took those blows and they did it because of kinship with the earth. Because they were so bound up into the mother, which is where they go back into the womb, what is a Kiva, but into the womb of the mother earth. And they teach that their people emerged from the Mother Earth. They came up, the emergence, onto the land of first man and first woman. And from that time forward, the Hopis were bound to their mother and would protect their mother at all costs, wouldn't you? So kinship with the Earth is profoundly important. It is a paradigm that is not just sweet sentimentality, but something that should give us strength and courage like the Hopi. Okay, I'm with the third one. I promise I'm trying to be brief. I'm watching this, so I'll be, I don't want to tax your patience, but kinship with all of our relatives. I was crazy when I went to seminary, I think. I think anybody who gets ordained is crazy. And you know who you are. <laughs> You've got to be a little nuts. And so I went off to seminary, and at the time, I want to be honest with you, my image of what it was to be a priest, I'm older than many of you, and some of you are in my generation, you'll know what I'm talking about. I had an image of what a priest was supposed to be that really came from an old Bean Crosby movie called The Bells of St. Mary's. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Yes. <laughs> And for those who are too young to know what we're talking about, it was this really sentimental, get out a hanky and wipe your eye, about the priest who just was just so gosh darn good and just did good. And the nuns were, oh golly, they were just so gosh darn good. And there was the little orphan kids and oh, they were just gosh darn good. <laughs> and you know, it was Ingrid Bergman as a nun, come on, that was great. Uh, so I had this image. And, um, and I got to seminary in, in the early 70s. Um, and like I said, I came from a Christian native family and I knew the Bible, I knew my traditions. I thought easy peasy, I'm here to learn. And it was in 1973 that I opened a book up by a man who became a good friend of mine. His name was Vine Deloria Jr. And Vine Jr. wrote a book called God is Red. And if you were a Christian, you ever want to have an Indian give you a good kick in the butt, read God is Red. Because basically, Vine Deloria was a Lakota from South Dakota. His dad uh, was a priest. 
and he grew up in a Christian family, but boy, when Vine broke with it, he broke with it, and he declared Christianity is the white man's religion. And if you're a real Indian, you won't have anything to do with it. Look what they did to us. And he recounted the truth. I never argued with the man. It was the truth. He told terrible stuff about what had happened to our people and the racism and the oppression and all of that. Well, in the 73, you, you know, those of you who are my age group, that was a time in the 60s and 70s when civil rights, women, gay and lesbian people were coming to understand their rights and the African Americans had, had fought the civil rights movement, were still fighting desperately for their rights. Latinos boycott lettuce and grapes, do you remember that? Well, I read God is Red and I had a crisis because what I couldn't argue with was the truth of what Vine was saying. And so I tried to understand what am I doing here? Why am I in a white man's school? Why am I trying to become a priest in three years? You can't become a holy man in three years. What am I doing here? And I had a lot of issues and I was really de depressed because I took, it was my life's calling from the time I was four years old. I either know what I'm doing or I'm in trouble. For me, it wasn't like just, oh, I think I'll midlife crisis, I'll change careers. For me, this was it, this is who I am. So I took this with incredible seriousness and I, I was so troubled and no one to talk to. Because in those days, I was one of only four Native Americans in a mainline center. So I started doing what I thought I should do as a Native person. Every morning at dawn, I went up to the roof of the building I lived on in Cambridge at Harvard. And I drew a circle with cornmeal on the ground. And I stood in it at dawn, rain or shine, and I lifted my voice up to the, to the Great Spirit. I acknowledged the four sacred directions. I honored the Mother, and I prayed, help me. I don't know what to do. And I did that morning after morning after morning. And I think it was quiet, it was about 5 a.m. And I think if people saw me, they'd think I was nuts. Because there's this strange guy standing out there in a circle of melting cornmeal, praying to the sky. And then I got an answer. And then I had a vision. And this is the part of the story that a lot of my students always were intrigued by, but didn't quite know what to do. I wish I could tell you I had a Cecil B. DeMille vision. I wish I could say I'm such an important spiritual guy that the heavens opened up. Any of you ever read Black Elk Speaks? If you read an old book called Black Elk Speaks, it's about a Lakota medicine man's vision. And wow, it's Paramount production. So it's great. There's horses in the sky and there's, there's just, oh my God, there's all kinds of stuff. I've always been an underachiever spiritually, so when God speaks to me, it's never, Go thou then, Stephen, unto the Hubalites and tell them. No, I didn't get that. I just got this one word, but how I got it is what is important. It was brought to me by a bird. I was standing up there praying, and suddenly I had that feeling. Haven't you had this? There have been moments when you suddenly felt somebody was looking at you. You ever had that? And you just, it's weird, but you just think, you just kind of start looking around. Somebody's staring at me. Well, I did. I looked around, and right over here, no farther from me than you are, just sitting on the top of the wall of, that, of the roof, was the biggest black crow I've ever seen. And it was absolutely motionless. And it just stared at me. Now, if any of you have ever understood crows like I do now, one of the bizarre things about crows is not only incredibly intelligent, but uh, crows actually have funerals. And a crow who is seen dead on the ground, other crows will gather in the trees or on wires and just quietly stare at it. And it's as though they know that one of their own has passed. They are spiritual beings. And I am very aware that in my ancestors' tradition, it was the crow that brought corn to the people and taught us what it was, but said, I'll always be back for my share. And so the crow is sacred, very sacred. And I stared at the crow, and the crow was staring at me, and then I heard the voice of God. And the voice of God was very simple. And it simply told me that I was to be patient, that the path that I now think is two will become one. And so that's all it said. And then the crow looked at me and spread its wings and took off into the sky. Do I believe that or not? 
what would you do? Some of you have had visions, and some of you have told others about them, but many of you haven't, or you've only told a few trusted friends, or you're afraid if I said, okay, everybody who's had a vision, stand up now, I want to hear your vision. <laughs> you'd be scared, because you'd think they'll all think I'm crazy, because we don't talk about that anymore in the polite church. We don't own and claim that vision, but I'm telling you the truth. There was the vision of the crow, a bird who came to me later reading Black Elk's great vision. There's a black bird in it, and other native people have talked to me about buffaloes and deer and ravens and animals, foxes that have come to them. And mark me well, I'm not talking about the cheap strip mining of native tradition by a bunch of people looking to make a dollar, telling them, oh, I'll give you a spirit animal, or I'll give you an animal name, or something like that, as though it was all about them, and it was all about doing something that would give them some power. The message we receive from God comes to us in kinship with God through the medium of those other sentient beings, because the ancient tradition of my people is accurate and true. That is, we are not alone, and we don't have to look for the mothership to make that statement. We are not alone because we're surrounded by sentience and spirituality if we only have the heart and eyes enough to see and hear it. There's nothing strange or odd at all about these other animals trying to communicate to us to share their spirit with us. Have you never looked into the eyes of an animal and seen something else there? Of course you have. Many of you have. If not all of us, how many of us in this room alone could we count? And what do we learn from it? What does it teach us? What does it tell us? That these sacred relatives of ours, these creatures, are part of God's economy. Economy of life. Economy of the spirit. Those of you who are Christians like me, if you think seeing a dove was strange, what's the dove there in the book for? The dove who represents the spirit, the dove who comes from the sky, the dove who hovers over Jesus at the baptism. Vision is kinship with God. And only when we have the vision quest within ourselves, only when we do like I did in my own way, my first feeble little vision quest, to go and ask for God's presence, do we establish that kinship, and then it can come to us in the form of all of our relations. Okay, here's the last one, and I'll quit. Um, there is a grave in Gravesend, England. And it is, uh, I think it's Christ Church. I believe it's Christ Anglican Church, and it's uh, in England. And it's the grave of Rebecca Rolfe. And Rebecca died uh, in the 17th century, about 16, 17, 16, 19. And Rebecca is buried there. Why is the grave of Rebecca important to my final thing about our kinship with one another? Because Rebecca's other name was Pocahontas. Rebecca Rolfe was Pocahontas. If I ask most non-native people, right off the top of your head, name two of the most famous Native American women in history. Pocahontas and Sacagawea. That's about it. I mean, really. And don't feel bad. Like, oh, I should know more. Well, no, we don't because we don't hear much about our women. But Pocahontas and Sacagawea. If Pocahontas was married to John Rolfe, she saved John Smith, but she married John Rolfe because John Smith took off like in Madame Butterfly and went back home. And so she married John Rolfe. And she was a supporter of the white colonialists and married to, to him. Then, in 1837, after she died, the federal government commissioned a massive painting to be hung in the rotunda of the American Capitol in Washington. And it's still there in the rotunda of Congress. And the painting is called The Baptism of Pocahontas. And if you go there, and if you've been there and seen it, Pocahontas is dressed in bride's white, 
and she's kneeling down while the Anglican minister is sticking his hand out over her to baptize her, and behind her is John Rolfe, the man she will marry, in his Puritan colonial kind of look, and all the white folks are leaning forward like this, and there's a couple of Indians down here in the corner of the painting, and one of them staring straight ahead looking disgruntled, and that's me. <laughs> because I looked at that painting and I asked myself, so why 1837? Why did they need a picture of the baptism of Pocahontas and the happy Indians accepting Christianity and supporting white folks in America? Well, it's because in 1831, only six years earlier, the United States was in a military dictatorship. Did you all know that? Were you aware that your government has not been a democracy, those of us who are American, but in fact went through a period of military dictatorship and that our dictator was named Andrew Jackson? Because in the court case that the Supreme Court settled, Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court of the United States told him, you may not drive native nations off their land in the southern United States. It is illegal and unconstitutional, and the answer from the Supreme Court to the executive branch is no. And Jackson's answer to John Jay, the Supreme Court Justice, was, well, you've made your decision, now let me see you enforce it. And as commander-in-chief of the army, he called the army together and began the mass deportation of the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Creek, the Seminole, and the Choctaw people off their land so they could bring more black slaves in to put on the plantations. And my people were removed under the terms of the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek in 1831 and forced march in which at least a third of our people died across the Ozark Mountains in the winter without any protection or any supplies to the new place for us in Oklahoma. And wasn't it interesting that shortly after that, while they were still driving other native nations west, the Cherokees and the Chickasaws and the Creeks, they decided it was time to put up the picture of Pocahontas so that when they went into the capital, they could feel good about themselves for what they'd done to our people. My people went on that trail of tears, as it's called, and died in their thousands as Christians, for we had converted to Christianity in the 1820s because we recognized it as being an extension of our own tradition, not because it was an alien thing forced on us, but because we believed in it and accepted it. And we were driven onto the trail of tears and died. And, now think about this with me, and when we went, we carried the bones of our dead with us. Who does that sound like? Right out of Egypt. Take my bones with you. Find it in the book. You'd be amazed. And the point was that when our ancestors died, my ancestors died, we were never buried in a private grave. We thought that would be one of the worst things that could happen to you. You'd be all alone for eternity in the grave by yourself. We had communal burials where your bones were mixed in with the bones of the other people so that you laughed and played and lived with them in eternity in, in heaven just like you did in life. Like ancient Egyptians, we liked what we were doing. We liked the world. We thought the world was good. We wanted to be what in, with one another forever? Kinship. We wanted to be in kinship. We carried the bones of our dead ones. We walked side by side. We, we had to bury our children on the way. We never wanted to break kinship. We would rather go together to die than to be separated. Kinship with one another is the core of what it means for us to honor the earth. Kinship with God, kinship with the earth, kinship with our relatives, and kinship with one another. Okay. What are the four things we take away? And I'm almost done. I'm not going to give you a big speech. But I am going to ask you to take these seriously with me. From these four understandings of our kinship arise an agenda of four things that we can do together in order to change our reality in honoring the earth and in restoring what we have lost and what is even now being stripped away and taken from all of us, whoever we are. Number one, to establish an interreligious sense of kinship with God. My coming here to the keyboard center is not just another rubber chicken dinner moment for me to get up and give another church talk. Believe me, look at me, look how old I am. Do you know how many church talks I've given? 
Have you never been to a committee meeting? My God, people. <laughs> Do you long for yet another meeting and another long talk? No. I came here because for us to establish an interreligious kinship with God means that we say, like we're trying to learn in this wonderful place, which I hope you all will be supporting financially to help them keep doing it, where we're saying to the world around us that we're sick and tired of being shuffled off into bunkers to fight one another for religious wars that should never happen. And that this image of humanities having kinship with whatever they hold to be the highest sacred thing for them should be mutually respected and tolerated and cultivated and understood. And that is our agenda as a revolutionary agenda for our own future as humanity. The second one, recognize kinship to the earth as the foundational witness of all faith communities. We need to have our faith leaders around the world declare that across all lines of division that our foundational witness is for kinship to this earth. I believe that is absolutely essential because, and I won't go into a long speech about why it's important that the Earth's in trouble, but I trust that you know enough to know that climate change and global warming are real, and that we need to have our leadership do this. One of the great failures of my life was the Genesis Covenant. I had this vision that I was going to challenge all the religious leaders of the United States in every institution. Methodist, Presbyterian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, we were all going to unite and we were all going to cut our carbon footprint by 50 to 75 percent in less than 10 years and by so doing make a witness to the importance of protecting the planet and at the same time make a global witness to the unity of people of faith. And I said in those days, do you imagine what this would do? The Episcopal Church, God bless her, agreed to do it and went ahead and did it on their own but I'm still waiting to get a call back from the Assemblies of God. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Edit that out. Uh, proclaim kinship with all living creatures as the universal religious definition of community. That's the third agenda of the Four Directions agenda. That we say that we proclaim that community must always be defined now, not only in terms of human relationships, but our relationships with other sentient beings. And that is the bottom line for us as people of faith. And the final one, overturn hierarchy. In order to develop kinship through egalitarian economic and environmental practices. There is no way that we will either save the planet or return to kinship with one another or with the world around us as long as we continue down the path of this ridiculous hierarchy of power and privilege that separates humanity into the haves and the have-nots. It is no longer viable for us as species of a global society to allow that nonsense to continue. We cannot have the vast majority of the Earth's wealth in the pockets of a handful of other human beings. It is ridiculous. We must reach that moment where we say that the egalitarian system of economic distribution is of paramount importance if we're going to save the planet. For the poor are aided and abetted in the destruction of their own homes in order to try and survive and eat. And so they cut down their own rainforests and pollute their own homes because they have no economic alternative to survive. It has to be a global effort from all of us. Well, that's my speech. I hope you all learned something. I hope you felt challenged and inspired by it. I hope it was a different take on what a native speaker could bring to you. And I'm so grateful for your patience in listening to me. I've really tried not to talk too much, but there's a lot I wanted to say, and I hope you'll remember most of it. Thank you, and God bless you for being here. Do Choctaw Indians chant as a uh, ritual? We sing, yes. Uh, I think our songs may sound like chant. We uh, do it with the drum, so you always have the accompaniment of the drum, which is so sacred to us. And uh, then when we sing, it would not sound to your ear like the somewhat, like almost a high falsetto sound of the Plains people. You're more familiar maybe with their, with their singing. Ours tends to sound more chant-like, 
and it's got this sort of cadence and rhythm. Because when we danced, we always danced touching each other. We always danced in line or holding each other. That was part of it. We must not break the chain of life. So yes, it would be like a chain. And is this rhythm you talk about anything like a heartbeat? Oh, all drum beats are like that in our people. Yes, very much so. You can hear the heartbeat of humanity, the heartbeat of God, in, in the sound of the drum. If you listen to the sound of the drum, the Hollywood version, uh, boom, 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 we never did that because that's not the heartbeat. The heartbeat is boom, 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 boom. It's a heartbeat sound. That's our sound. And is that uh, a type of prayer? Absolutely. Anytime the drum is played in a sacred manner, it is a type of prayer. And it's played universally among North American Native people. I've been among the Inuit and in Point Hope when I was Bishop of Alaska. I spent most of my time in villages with the Native people and uh, have listened to them play songs, some of which are so old they can't actually translate all the words that they've memorized because they've been singing those songs for 8,000 years. Thank you. You're very welcome. So what do we do when the scripture gives us mixed messages about how we relate to the earth? Uh, it's, it's the same thing when I said earlier. Um, in any people's story, covenant, I don't want to uh, impose a word on anyone here from whatever your tradition is. But when I talk about an, a testament, an original testament, a Hebrew covenant, I'm trying to describe that ancestral ancient kinship memory that has been translated into our scriptures or our songs or whatever. So when you encounter part of that memory, as I said, that is skewed or seems wrong, uh, remember I said that um, uh, did we all get it right? No. Did we all get it wrong? No. There are some things that native tradition has taught that I believe need to be corrected. And part of the reason, and here's full disclosure, I'm a Christian, is I see Jesus as the native Messiah. And my book that uh, Gwen was kind enough to mention, The Four Vision Quests of Jesus, is a Christology that has nothing to do with Western tradition. It is a strictly out of the root of our tradition. This is what Jesus would look like if the pilgrims had never landed, uh, but we heard about Jesus. We don't need the pilgrims to tell us about Jesus. So the answer to your question is, that's some areas where any ancient covenant, any ancient story wasn't 100% right, which is why we need a continued kinship with God to help us find our way through the spirit to deeper and deeper levels of truth. Uh, what forestalls that is where we divide ourselves into bunkers of faith. What accelerates it is when we do what we're doing right now. Because when I hear what Hindus think and Buddhists think and Muslims think and Wiccans think, I'm intrigued and it opens my mind and my awareness. I have no fear of that. And it may help me through the intervention of the spirit in learning and gaining wisdom, which is what the spirit is all about, uh, how to correct some of the earlier mistakes, like the dominance of the earth. That has to go. Um, I'm of Mexican descent, and something that is more Catholic than I was raised Protestant, of uh, the Virgin Mary, if you could share your thoughts about it. I'll do it as quickly as I can, because you actually touched on a very deep subject for me. Um, my life has not always been easy, and like many of you, I've suffered many losses, griefs, and pain in my life. Um, at one point, when it was very acute as a younger man, I'm guessing in my 30s, I uh, went into a Roman church, Roman Catholic church, and uh, because I just felt like the car was turning there, and I was really down, and I drove in, uh, thank God it was open, and I went in and I saw the statue of Mary with the little votive candles flickering under her. And I knelt down in front of that statue and said, I don't know what else to do. I don't know you. I don't know how to talk to you. But I'm desperate, and anything you could do to help me, I'm here. And I felt the presence of a feminine spirit of love and strength so deeply that it changed my life. And I've honored Mary ever since. And I do the rosary and I honor her, but I honor her as a flesh and blood woman. 
not as a cardboard cutout or caricature that into which she has been made. And I do it, and I'll share this very briefly with some few simple points. Where do you think Jesus learned his spirituality? From Mary. Who stood by him all the way to the cross? Mary. Who had the guts to stand up and tell him when he was a child about the inequalities that he could see around him? It was his mother Mary, I'm sure of it. So to me, she's not some icon, distant and removed. She is a living woman that needs to be treasured and honored as an example of the deep wisdom, strength, courage, and, and teaching that all women do. And in my tribe, my nation, the Chata people, we are a matrilineal, matriarchal tribe. And we honor women as the doctors and, and wise women of the people. And so Mary, to me, uh, becomes that kind of a symbol and living presence, and I believe she is a living presence. And I'm glad you asked me, because I, I'm always happy to witness to who Mary is to me and invite others to get to know her better.